So like I said, welcome everybody. This is the noon webinar series. It's the fourth of a four part series. And my name is Susan DeBleek and I coordinate the Master Gardener program for Iowa. Today, we're gonna steal 60 minutes of your time. I'm gonna do a quick welcome. Dr. Lena Rodriguez Salamanca is going to give a presentation about plant pathology. And then we'll jump into a Q and A, which is super fun to see what kind of questions you all have out there. And I just wanted to highlight a couple projects because many of you are ready to start volunteering in your community. Um, so these are a couple award-winning projects. These projects won the Search for Excellence Award, and that's an award application that's due each spring. So please remember that. Um, so in Marshall County, the Learning Gardens is where Master Gardener volunteers supported school gardens and donated the produce to the, to the food pantry and also put on workshops for the youth about growing vegetables. And also wanted to highlight Pocahontas County where they've been putting on a spring workshop in the community uh, for 400 participants and to share with people about things like beekeeping, native perennials, and tree care. So these are just a couple Search for Excellence winners. And then some of you may have heard about the Growing Together project. Um, it's going on in a quarter of Iowa counties. And so if you don't know if your county is participating in this, reach out to the person who coordinates your county Master Gardener program. And this is where Master Gardener volunteers tend donation gardens and encourage gardeners to donate fresh produce to food pantries and food banks. And we have many grants available to the ISU Extension and Outreach offices. Um, and so 2021 is our fifth year of the, of the project and we've got um, two to $4,000 available for those county extension offices. And those funds for this project go to things like seeds, seedlings, trees, bins for produce, that sort of thing. So it's a really cool project that you can learn more about on the Master Gardener website. Um, and also, like I mentioned, you all are starting your, some of you are already volunteering and you've reached out um, about what you're doing in your community. Feel free to put in the chat what you're already getting involved with as a volunteer. So the website here is where to log your Master Gardener volunteer hours. You all are already on that website. Uh, your username is your email address and you just click forgot password and your password will be emailed to you. Um, and so pretty soon starts the time that you'll you'll want to start doing those 40 volunteer hours. They're not due until December 31st, 2021. And um, yeah, find ways in your community to safely volunteer and, and uh, give back now that you've taken the training. So this is our Master Gardener website. Uh, feel free to go to it for updates and upcoming events. I know we've got some webinars posted there. And then I bet Lena is going to bring this up. Um, the Horticulture and Home Pest newsletter is a fantastic website. So feel free to take a look at this website and you'll probably see uh, us, us encourage you to, to look up different articles there when you do have questions. And with that, I wanted to welcome Dr. Lena um, to come present to us about plant pathology. Thanks, Sue. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for having me, but let's go through it. All right, so as a Master Garden volunteer, I, I think you could do so much with the plant pathology knowledge uh, that we are uh, sharing here. Um, and I want you to think of a couple things that would be important in your Master Gardener career. Um, you may face plant problems uh, in your own garden that you have to troubleshoot and figure out, but you may also uh, end up helping others with their plant problems. Um, and what we want to encourage you to do is to be a good citizen scientist. Uh, use the information, the, the lessons from Master Gardener to help you troubleshoot um, problems. Um, be a skeptical. Sometimes it's very easy to say, oh, it's got to be A, this particular problem. 
but is it really? Do you have all the information that you need? And why is that? Well, some diseases are minor and you can only take, you know, with a few steps like pruning or the changing the way that you water in your vegetable garden, you can do so much. But there are other problems that are deadly and that will have serious implications, not only in your garden, but in other ecosystems in the forest or nature areas. So it will be very important that you actually figure out what is that is causing the problem. And more importantly, because management of different diseases can be very different. You manage a problem that is mainly cosmetic or unsightly very differently. It may be enough to just prune some uh, branches of your shrub or tree. But there are some others that are very, very serious. And if you don't take the right management steps, um, you may need and you may uh, endanger endanger other uh, more important plants in your city, like uh, important high value trees, for example. So I want to tell you a little bit of what I do uh, on a daily basis at the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic, and what is that is the foundation of diagnostics, meaning you're trying to find out what is wrong with that plant. So every day. I collect information about the plant, um, but I also are uh, using my observation skills. I look for symptoms and I describe them. I look for evidence or signs of pathogens, and I have lots and lots of tools in the clinic where I have uh, various microscopes available to me, many tests that I can run, um, and many uh, experts that I can reach to. But very often, I rely heavily on my client, on the person that is experiencing the plant problem, because their eyes on the garden, on the forest, on the park, is what is going to collect what patterns are occurring in the plant. So the symptoms may be on a particular area of the plant, and it may be changing or not in time and space. So we'll go through all this uh, concepts today. Um, and hopefully clarify uh, the lecture that you saw uh, on the YouTube video. But let's start with uh, a poll here. I'm gonna um, read the question here. What do you see? I'm gonna show you some evergreens. Um, and you have two options. Look at the two options I'm giving you. Is, are the symptoms mainly in inner needles, um, like your yellowing, scattered throughout the canopy or three, or are the symptoms specific to a branch, um, and then mainly to the bottom of the canopy. All right, you ready? This is the photo here, and the poll is now up. So take a look. Remember A, the symptoms are in the inner needles, the yellow and scattered throughout the canopy of the tree, or B, there are specific branches that are affected, and most are at the bottom of the canopy. Okay, it looks like over half of the people have voted. All right. So let me know when you want me to close it down. A couple more seconds. How about now? Great. Good job, definitely. This is a case where the inner needles are the ones that are showing the symptoms, but are also scattered throughout the canopy. And you can see that very well in the arborvitae. Um, so, and when you look into the pine, the same story is true. So this is one of the most important things I want you to think about and take with you today, because the patterns on the plant are going to help narrow down what the problem may be. If there are symptoms that are related to one side, you may be dealing with a vascular wilt uh, or a root rot pathogen. If it's mainly on the upper leaves, you may have something related with a nutrient deficiency. Some viruses can cause that pathogen, but it could also be a vascular wilt pathogen. If you have individual branches that are affected, maybe talking about a canker or an injury uh, caused by an insect or a physical injury. If all the leaves are affected, this is most likely a biotic, some sort of stressor, um, or it could be a root rot. 
or if it's something on the main stem, it will be very important to document that too. If you see symptoms on the lower leaves primarily, then it is possible that it's a nutrient deficiency from a nutrient that is mobile, that as new leaves on the top of the plant need that nutrient, then the nutrient is translocated up and therefore the lower leaves look really sad. But this could also be where a lot of fungi and bacteria uh, will start causing problems. And then in time and space, they start moving into the top of the plant. So back to the pine and the arbovitae, the symptoms here are needle yellowing, needle drops uh, follows the needle, needles that are yellowing. The patterns is definitely in the inner needles and throughout the crown of the tree. And one important part is the timing. This is happening right now in my trees and the trees everywhere around the city, and it's a seasonal needle drop. But sometimes if it's the first time that you are encountering a pine or an evergreen in general, you may not know that's the case. Um, and this is a natural process. Uh, evergreens will drop their needles every two to three years, um, and they will put up new um, in the following spring. It's a natural process, and therefore, as you may remember this, there's no signs. Um, so let's see how much you remember from the uh, video. Another poll here, number two for you, Susan. Um, take a look at those photos. Are this symptoms or signs? What do you remember from the lecture? Great, I just launched the poll. And we've got some really smart cookies, Lena. I'm sorry we don't get to connect with them in person, but they, yeah, there's a really great group sure. this year. Good, good. So 60% of people have voted. A few more votes are trickling in. A couple more seconds. All right, let's see the results. All right, sharing them now. It looks like most people said signs. 65% of people said signs. Good job. They are signs. What we have in here are fungal conks on the, on the left side that are causing butt rut on a, um, I believe this was a locust tree. We have uh, on the middle here, this alien looking thing is a gall caused by our rust um, in a cedar tree. We have bacteria dripping from an apple um, here that ooze are evidence or signs of that bacterial pathogen. And this, it, the top right, is actually a fungal body um, looked under the microscope at high magnification where you can see um, the spores are the slender, very thin um, spores of a fungal pathogen. So just a reminder, why do we put so much focus on the differentiation between signs and symptoms? Because sim like the signs are that evidence of the pathogen. It's, it's a pathogen itself, it's parts or products seen on the host plants. Some examples here, we have cysts on the carrots uh, roots. If you were to cut in there on those little galls, you will have nematode uh, cyst, so those microscopic uh, plant pathogenic worms will be right there, but you will need magnification, very high magnification and some staining to be able to see those. And this hosta here, you have those blobs of uh, kind of tan and brown uh, little balls, if you will. Those are sclerotia from a fungi, and those are signs of that fungi. Once again here, you have the little ooze, the little droplet, that looks like a milky ooze, that is a sign of bacteria that is oozing out of those tissues. And then uh, lastly, in this geranium, you have mycelia of this particular fungal uh, pathogen on the geranium plant. All those are evidence of the pathogen per se and its products on the plant. And you may see them, but sometimes you may not see them because they are microscopic. And sometimes you may need to get a test in order to detect what is the evidence inside the plant tissue. As opposed to the symptoms, which is what we most often will notice first on a plant problem. And the symptom is the external and internal alterations 
of a plant as a result of a disease, meaning that it's caused by a pathogen, but also as a result of a disorder, meaning an abiotic, where not necessarily a pathogen or an insect pest will be causing the symptom, but instead an environmental or a stressor um, or different factors will cause abiotic disorder. So not a pathogen will be um, in the tissue. Even if it's sent to a diagnostic clinic, um, no pathogen will be found. All right, so we'll cover so far some symptoms and signs and patterns too. We'll go through some uh, very common problems in Iowa so that you can then build up your knowledge on those symptoms. So symptoms on this tomato uh, particularly here, I get this in my garden every year. There are little spots that start at the bottom of a canopy, uh, start a span, and then they will enlarge. The borders are dark, the centers are lighter. And then this eventually will cause some of those leaves to blight, meaning a rapid death of that tissue. Um, and it can cause the foliation on your tomato plant. Um, and your tomato fruit, however, stays clean. You do not see any symptoms on the, on the um, fruit. Perhaps you have some sun scald because you don't have a lot of uh, foliage to protect the uh, fruit, but you don't see any spots on the fruit. And this is very important because there are many, many uh, pathogens that can cause blight and spots on, on uh, tomato plants. So something to remember is that for plant pathologists, it's very, very important the difference between a blight, meaning the general and rapid death of leaves, branches, twigs, or flower parts. And the reason is that when we talk about blight, the pathogen is when you are seeing the symptoms. So either the bacteria, the fungi, or the virus is right there where the symptoms are observed. But when we plant pathologists and new master gardeners in the future will refer to a symptom as wilt, is because the pathogen is most likely located either on the vascular tissue um, that conduct water in the plant or on the root. And you will see this symptom as more of a, a loss of rigidity, drooping of, uh, you know, the, the leaves look like drooping, like they don't have enough water. Um, and you won't see any particular spots on those leaves because the pathogen is not in the leaves once again. It is actually either on the vascular system or at the roots of the plant. So back to the tomato though, um, you can see those signs, uh, the evidence of the actual fungal pathogen. Very often, if you have the right conditions, um, you may be able to see little dots inside the tan uh, area of the spot. Um, but under the microscope to confirm it, I will look for this particular fungal structure. It's called a pygnidia. It has like a little bottle shape. And then inside that bottle shape, the spores will be formed and splashed uh, by the rain. This is a fungal pathogen. It's called septoria lycopersisi. And this disease is called septoria leaf spot and blight. And we can do a lot to prevent it. If you are very good about spacing your tomatoes, if you are good about taking those suckers and training and giving support to your tomatoes, but also if you're watering your tomatoes, make sure that you're watering at the base of the plant as opposed to increasing humidity throughout the canopy. All right, another quest here, poll number three. Look at this photos and let me know if this ones are symptoms or signs. couple more seconds here. People are strongly voting for one over the other. So we're getting, Excellent. we're getting the concept. I know symptoms and signs is always a really tough one. It is. I'll give it five more seconds and then I'll share the poll results. Sounds good. Okay. It looks like people voted for symptoms. 88% of people Excellent. voted for symptoms. They are definitely symptoms. We have here on this pair what we call a blight. And if you follow the uh, stem, you will find a canker right there where the changing of color between what is dead and what is alive. 
in the middle, we have a color break. You'll find this as a mosaic um, or ring spots sometimes. And then on the uh, right, you have some browning of those needles on the screws. Well, let's talk about this particular one. This is in a pear. Um, the leaves and the branches start to blight, remember, meaning that the pathogen is actively causing the symptom right there where you see it. And then eventually it causes death of the tissue and the tissue turns black. Now, some of those shoots will turn um, kind of like a curl, like a shepherd's crock, like the one on the right here. In those cankers, if you follow where the, dish, the tissue is dying, um, here on the right, that photo shows them in there, um, there will be those sunken and discolored bark, is what we call a canker. As far as signs for this disease, you may see them as bacterial ooze coming out of the flowers of, or the fruit, um, but it's, this is produced on a particular set of uh, warm and wet weather in the spring, so you may miss this. This is a bacterial pathogen caused, uh, called Erwinia armillivora, and the disease is fire blight. And it looks like this in years where we had a lot of um, humidity in the spring, or the, the pathogen um, was uncontrolled the prior year and able to overwinter in the wood. Um, and a lot of the bacteria will duplicate and, and reproduce on the tissues, and it will be moved uh, by rain, by pollinators, while the um, trees are flowering, um, and you may see those oozing conditions um, in the spring. Now, it's important that you know about this, uh, what is causing this problem, because that bacteria, if you were not to take action and prune this type of shoots, those shepherd crocs, at least 12 inches from where you see the symptoms, then eventually the bacteria will move to the wood on larger branches and even the trunk. And that there will be very little you can do because the bacteria will hide on those cankers that you can see in here. That sunken area that is this color is where the bacteria lives. However, one thing that you also need to think about is that diseases tend to run in families. And so this bacterial disease is called fire blight again, and it goes to apples and pears, but not to stone fruit or any ornamental uh, prunus. Now, remember I was telling you to be a skeptical? I do have occasions where people think they have fire blight and they say, but I did everything you said. And when they actually have, and when they send me a sample, instead of having oozing from the bacteria, I have fungal bodies developing on those cankers. And there are various fungal um, pathogens that are not picky eaters. They will go in through many, many woody plants. Um, some, to name a few, Botrysferia and Cytosphora can do this type of damage to on trees, not only on apple, crab apples, uh, pears, etc., but in other types of woody plants. So remember, be skeptical, do your work, observe, sharpen those observation skills, look for patterns. So let's take a look to this one. I will ask you a question about this one. Take a closer look at the symptoms and the distribution. And when you're ready, uh, Sue, so you can uh, pull, this is poll number four, please. So what do you see on this uh, pattern? Is the inner leaves um, changing, like scattered through the plant? Or is a specific branch or stem that is affected? Um, is it located at the bottom of the canopy, at the top? Great, Probably so it looks not. like folks are trying to take a deep look to see where, where the pattern is taking place. And it looks like 65% of people have voted, so I'll give it a few more seconds. Sounds good. So it looks like 87% of people said that it was a specific branch or stem that was affected and it was most of the bottom of the canopy. That is correct. So what we have here is one particular stem that is showing symptoms and you have a lot of others that are not. 
Um, so this particular disease is called tobacco rattle virus, and it will start sometimes at the base of the plant, um, very often at the base of the plant, where the chlorotic bands or ring spots that form on the leaves. This strange color breaking um, model or mosaic are another um, type of symptoms that you'll see. And the symptom development will start from that particular leaf and then will move in that stem and then moving to other stems over time. So it changes in time and space. Um, here on the top, you see more of the concentric rings or ring spots uh, that are kind of like, it looks like, a, like an alien have left a message for you. There's all those rings right there. And you may wonder, okay, but why, why does the spirit start uh, closer to, to the um, base of the plant? Um, a couple of things here, because um, we, in addition to the host that I have in there, like peony and bleeding heart, we have others, in, in that, including weeds. But the most important part is the way that it is transmitted. For the most part, this is a virus that is transmitted by soil inhabiting root nematodes. Those uh, nematodes that are that like to nub on the roots of plants, and they will carry the virus, uh, and that's the way that the, the virus gets into your plants. The other way that this virus uh, moves around is with our help. If we are splitting our plants, that vegetative propagation will move the virus from one spot to the next. So if you are sharing with the, your fellow master gardener or your neighbor plant material, make sure that you are sure that your plants are clean and have not had any symptoms. But also, if let's say you have this problem on um, bleeding hard, your plant probably did not make it to the winter, but then you, for some reason, you move either soil or um, a shovel that was contaminated with that soil uh, into your new a bed of bleeding hearts, you may be moving those nematodes and the virus per se. So there's so much you can do as a master gardener to prevent um, problems. And if you learn and you get the proper diagnosis, you know exactly what are the steps that you need to take uh, to prevent that in the future. Okay, one more question. I'm going to show you a photo and I want you to think about if uh, this is an abiotic disorder, meaning that no pathogen or pest is involved that is related to environmental stress, and therefore the symptoms will be most likely static in time and space, or if this problem may be a bi biotic one, a disease, so a pathogen or an insect pest causing the symptoms, um, it may start as a hot spot on a branch uh, and then may change in time and space. Uh, signs may be present, but may need to be confirmed by lab testing, or maybe you're not sure. Okay, so take a good look, and this will be question five, Sue. Yeah, and I'm going to launch it, and it looks like uh, we may have messed up on the poll, and we only have the first two options. Oh, okay. Is this for the maple? Yes. Yeah, so C is not an option on here. Um, right. So sorry about that. That's okay. It looks like half of people are have voted, and this looks like a a tough tough question to figure out if it's abiotic or biotic. Yeah, let's see the the answers. So it All looks right. like seventy two percent of people chose that it was abiotic. All right, that's good. And you know, I think that once you see something, you start remembering what a problem looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, I have put in there, I don't have enough information because often there's so little information you may be able to extract from a photo like this. Uh, when I see a photo like this, I will ask you for so many more photos. I want to see, I cannot see if this is one particular branch. Um, I cannot see if the leaves are dropping. I cannot see how the trunk looks, how the base of that particular tree looks, how the top is a dying back. What are other symptoms? Uh, so I would choose, I don't have enough information. I really want to see more. But let's say I, they share more photos with me. And what I could confirm is that it was 
chlorosis and yellowing across the whole canopy. Um, and then something very particular is that the yellowing leaves those veins uh, that are green. So the, the veins remain green um, on the leaves. It's widespread in the tree canopy and really the tree is not dropping its leaves necessarily. Um, so as far as signs, it, when I get samples like this, there's no signs and it's simple because this is an abiotic disorder. This is a manganese deficiency on maples. Uh, so there won't be any particular uh, pathogens associated with it. Sometimes for trees that are stressed and live with a deficiency like this, eventually uh, other things may come, opportunistic pathogens or opportunistic um, insects that may take advantage of the stressor. But the overlying condition, the underlying condition will be the manganese uh, deficiency. Great job, everyone. Okay, one more. Are this symptoms or signs? All right, so I put the poll up there and hopefully folks can see the pictures to tell us if these are symptoms or signs. And so far half of the people have voted, so I'll continue to keep that open. Sounds good. Okay, it looks like 86% chose signs. Good job, excellent. So yes, they're all signs. There are evidence and structures of pathogens. Um, three of those photos are fungi, and of course, one is an insect. Um, I'll tell you, here on the top, we have ash frost. You will see this in advanced uh, stages of uh, the formation of those fungal bodies. Uh, on the close-up, we have hawthorn rust, and there's also, um, those little pockets are filled with a lot of spores, uh, rust spores. And here on the left, we have one that is very interesting. This is a fungal mat on an oak. So this particular sign forms in the spring on oak trees that have been, um, that were infected with the fungal pathogen Brettsiella phagaceorum on the prior year and the tree went undiagnosed, undetected. But the tree, this tree particularly, um, fungal mats are only formed on red oaks. Red oaks that were infected the prior year and that died and were undetected. Now, to find this particular fungal mat, you may miss it because you see in here, the, the bark was cut out um, and you may only notice it as one, a fruity smell that is coming from the trunk to a gray looking crack, but it will be very subtle. Um, and so if you cut in, then you may find that the fungal mat is right under. So the fruity smell is what the fungal pathogen produces to attract beetles. And those beetles are the way that this fungi moves long distances. Um, and if, if you have an oak, especially a red oak, that starts losing its leaf from the top or one side of the tree midsummer, um, a tree that perhaps was pruned um, in the spring as opposed to winter, uh, then is a very serious candidate for oak wilt. It's very important that you remember not to prune your oaks um, in the spring or summer. Do it when they're dormant. Do it when those beetles are not around and looking for things to eat. Because again, if those beetles are active, they will bring the spores to that freshly cut uh, pruning wound. And then your tree will be infected with this deadly disease of oaks. Um, again, this fungal pathogen is called Brettsiella phagaceorum uh, and it causes oak wilt uh, in oaks, all kinds of oaks. All right, so I hope you had um, a lot of fun going through our quizzes. And uh, do you remember the approach to uh, investigating plant problems is something that I do also in my daily uh, routine. When I see a plant, uh, and I see a lot of different kinds of plants, it's like, what are those common problems for this plant? If you love hydrangeas, 
you know, get education on what hydrangeas uh, more commonly suffer from insects and diseases. Um, if you want to get into a lot of kale uh, growing or tomatoes, there's lots of information on what to look for. Um, and you can do so much by planting resistant varieties, but also rotating your garden or increasing spacing uh, among your plants. Now, what else, you know, okay, you have a list of common problems, but then based on the patterns, the symptoms, and if there are any signs, if you put all that information together, what are the suspects here? Are you thinking there might be an insect problem? Are you thinking that maybe you're overwatering? Or are you thinking that there may be a pathogen that is causing a problem? Can you rule out any possibilities? For example, if you're missing information, if the pattern is not fitting with an insect borer, you can scratch that one out. And that way you would make your list of potentials um, smaller. As you look at the information you collect, is there more evidence that you can collect? Look at the base of the plant, inspect every single part, plant part. Look at the base of the plant, the stem, look at some uh, branches or, or other uh, leaves here and there. So that make sure that you have all the information and evidence that there is to collect. And myself, I know when to seek assistance. And I do this very often. Um, I have an entomologist that can help me if I find an insect. I do question again, I'm a skeptical, right? Is this a just a happening? Does this insect got to my sample out of uh, randomness or is it really a problem. So I will inspect then more branches or more plants to see if it's there. Um, and sometimes again, some insects and uh, fungi and bacteria are more of a saprophytic. They take a chance after an underlying conditions. So I make sure to also ask my uh, uh, colleagues at the horticulture department. They know very much about care of plants. Plants that are good for Iowa plants that uh, will perform well or that will be easily um, prone to winter injury. And I also have a network of diagnosticians and plant pathologists that I can reach out. Um, and seeking assistance is one of the most important things that you can do as a citizen um, scientist. And remember, if you need assistance, we're always here at the Plant Insect Diagnostic Clinic. We're right here on campus. There's three of us. We have an entomologist and two plant pathologists. And if you're about to collect a sample, always remember, as fresh as possible, if you're not in, um, close to the university, keep in mind transit time. Do not mail things on Friday or Thursday. Please do not collect things that are dead. I, I, my most memorable sample was a tomato sample in November from a gardener. I cannot tell anymore from a dead root system what was wrong in the summer. Make sure that um, you collect representative samples of what you're seeing. All those clues that you have done from the you know, investigative work, the pattern, the symptoms, the signs, what else is infected, all those things. Uh, include them on the submission form. We do have on our website a lot of information on what to collect by particular plant type. Um, and in the back of your mind, always keep this idea of where do you see the symptoms versus where the pathogen may be. Because if you send me a handful of leaves, I may not be able to help you out because the pathogen may be on the roots or on the stems, for example, or some branches. Um, and for example, uh, for a vascular pathogen, we always require branches or stems. For the root ruts, we do need a root tissue to test. Um, if you're not sure, you can always contact us with photos. We do have a submission form online where you can upload photos and information, and we can guide you on the type of sample to collect. However, as you can see, we have a lot of symptoms, and there is a lot of symptoms that look alike. So a pathogen may, different pathogens may cause very similar symptoms. So we will not provide with a diagnosis, diagnosis from a photo. The photos become one more clue that will help us gather information. If you have a problem on an annual plant and you're sending the whole plant, make sure that you're bagging the root system. You don't have to cut the plant at the base. No, no, keep it together, all the plant, you dig it out, and then you put a bag 
at the base of the root ball to keep it together because otherwise in, tr in transit, this is how it's gonna look. Also do not send us um, payment. We do charge $20 for plan problem diagnosis, but we will charge you after the report is done. Make sure that we have plenty of tissue. Anytime that we see anything like this, we just really wanna cry because we can't tell very much from that. Ideally, we want information, as many clues as possible on the submission form, a representative sample, enough tissue, and photos. You can send photos printed, but you don't have to print them. You can save trees. You can email it to us or submit them on our uh, digital submission form. And all that we do in the clinic is put together those clues on digital photos, the clues that you've written at the submission form, and then we will observe, collect information from the sample, and also decide a course of action of what test we're gonna run on the sample, and then consult with experts. So I hope you had lots of fun. Um, this is time for questions, and then we'll, help, we'll go over some concluding remarks. So what questions do you have? Thank you so much, Lena. Um, so it looks like in the Q&A, uh, going back to when you were talking about um, uh, different pathogens that move through the soil, it looks like there's a question about how do we cleanse soil in a large garden plot if we know that there is a problem? Well, one is, my first question will be, what are you trying to clean? Um, you know, there are some things that you may be able to um, plant brassicas, mustards, uh, or marigolds uh, for nematode control, but if you have a fungi that produce ferocia, you are going to need to think about what host uh, will not get infected with that particular pathogen because there's really nothing else you can do to remove or treat those particular sclerotia, that, that those little overwintering uh, structures. It really depends on what you're trying to clean up. Right, and, and maybe the first step in all that too is finding out what the problem really is before you get too far down your list of options, right? That's right. And then it looks like one question is about um, just just giving us a, a breakdown of let, letting us know the distinction between a canker and a gall. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the way that I think about a gall is think about it as a tumor. So what goes on is the pathogen um, either it's able to inject something into the plant so that tissue proliferation happens, or the plant itself, by detecting the pathogen, starts creating that tissue around it. Um, th the other alternative is the pathogen will, it will be, a, what you see in the goal is a combination of tissue from the pathogen and tissue from the plant. So a gall is more of a tumor. Um, they tend to be either uh, rounded or more like sausage-like. Now, when we talk about a canker, you think of a, a clean wood, you know, like a um, branch that feels smooth and everything. But when the canker, when you see the canker, the tissue is sunken and the discolor and is discolored. So you will see a border. Very often is uh, light in color or orange red. Um, and you can notice that change from the canker where it's sunken to the tissue that is normal. And I, I will uh, show you the, the couple of things that we have on the, on the Hort News. We have lots of photos and we have um, a lot. Yes, so that, that's a tumor right there. One of the, um, this is a bacteria that causes galls, but um, fungi also cause galls like rusts or, um, or for example, um, black knot is one that is also a gall type. Yes. Nice. Um, and it looks like one, uh, one question that came in when you were talking about fire blight, um, you're talking about the bacteria moving. Um, and so this person was, was asking, will it eventually kill the tree, the pear tree, um, and should it be taken down? Well, I think over a period of years, uh, what will happen is more and more um, shoots will become infected. Eventually, the bacteria will go in the wood. Um, the productivity of the tree is going to go down. Um, but I, alone, it won't necessarily kill the tree. But other um, stressors may come um, to help with the decimation of the tree. 
Yeah. And I feel like um, I've heard before when people want you to like be a uh, crime detective and it's like, this tree is dead. What happened, Lena? And it's like, it's, it's already gone. It, and that's a really good point. The early you notice problems, track it down, take photos, take notes, because the earlier you find a problem, the best your chances are of actually having a tactic that will work. If you wait too long, it's a moment of you learn for the future, but there will be very little to do to save with the plant. Yeah. Um, and I know one, one thing that you talked about is like not trying to move things around too much because that's that can cause problems and one question that came in is do you think it's safe to use compost from a compost site yeah the compost is, is my nemesis i really worry about those trees that go undiagnosed that may have verticillium and the, the those trees will go um, and be chipped and that pathogen those the, it will make a little sclerotia, a tiny little dot that will overwinter in the wood. Um, so I would love to use um, compost that has been treated with steam um, or, you know, compost where I can feel much better. Like I chip my own um, brush where I know that nothing had symptoms and I can reuse the brush myself. But not everyone had that opportunity. Um, but yeah, mulch can be a way to move uh, pathogens, yes. And after the derecho this summer, we've got a lot of piles of mulch and of wood. And what, what can Master Gardener volunteers do to make sure that we don't take something from one tree and spread it all around the town? Yeah. Well, one thing is um, you could look into our verticillium wilt page. There's a list of susceptible um, trees and shrubs versus a, uh, a list of resistant ones. And so I would be, you know, you guys have the perfect um, eyes and education now to be on top of looking, uh, you know, I put a mulch on this tree, it's one of the susceptible, I'm gonna watch it over time. And if it start uh, showing uh, leaves that are yellowing, dropping in the middle of the summer, um, you know, kind of like flagging and dying back, then you may have a problem there. Um, but if, if you are concerned, then maybe just spread the mulch on plants that are not hosts um, and see what, what happens. Yeah, and we've got a couple questions that came in about the timing of pruning for different types of shrubs and trees. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to speak on that and then I can also share a link um, with folks that might tell them a little bit about that. Yes, so um, I think the most important one is oaks. In my mind, is the disease is so deadly that please do not uh, prune your oaks in the spring or summer. Make sure that you do it in the winter when they are dormant and when those beetles are not active. That's the most important part for me. Then from there, in terms of management practices, um, I think more of uh, making sure that you're pruning below where the cankers are, at least 12 inches. Um, but the truth is, is that my, my colleagues in horticulture are the ones that help me out. Uh, and I, I just use their resources at the Extension Store and at the Four News site uh, a lot. And I recommend you do too, uh, so that you make sure. I learn all the time that my privets would only need to be prune after they're flowering, for example. And I'll just go into the whole news and type the plant I'm looking into uh, or to the extension store, and then uh, I'll just follow their directions. Yeah, we've got so many great um, folks like yourself with awesome expertise to help, help each other. There's a lot of sharing of pictures <laughs> and ideas. Um, one question came through, and um, this is a really good one because it's talking about, you know, stopping the spread. So what, what are your recommendations for cleaning garden tools um, to pre prevent um, spreading something or contamination? Yeah, so um, it depends if you're using metal ones versus some of the uh, coated ones or plastic ones. Um, I think in general, um, make sure that when you're pruning, you can clean either with alcohol, uh, like, you know, rubbing alcohol. Um, you can use bleach, diluted bleach. However, if you're 
you may cause some rust on your on your tools so alcohol is a lot better um, make sure that when you're working on cleaning the garden you start from plants that did not have any problems or any diseases and pull those you know pull that debris first and then um, do not compost uh, the ones that did have problems or diseases. Those are better either buried, uh, burnt, if, if uh, your municipality allows, or put in the trash. Because um, if they did have problems, the pathogens will most likely stay on that debris. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you put it out of your garden. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and going back, um to the beginning of like the signs and signs and symptoms. So what's your like elevator pitch, just reminding us all like the difference between signs and symptoms, because it can just be a hard concept to grasp, but then once we get it, it's like it unlocks. Right. So think about signs as the culprit, what is causing the problem. So it could be, um, you know, it could be a fungal mat on the cost on the on um, oak rope, for example. Um, it could be tiny fungal bodies. Um, it could be um, galls that have uh, tendrils, like in rusts, where they have those little uh, gelatinous-looking things um, in the spring. So, and if you're not sure, you know, we have all those photos on the on the site on the Hort News site. You can kind of compare them in there. Uh, but think about those signs are evidence of the pathogen. It's a crime scene, right? So you're collecting evidence. Um, so you, it's like, okay, in a crime scene, you may look for the weapon. In this case, you're looking for the evidence of that pathogen. Um, sometimes you will see it. In some other cases, you may need to do some uh, submission of samples for a lab test. And that is true for a lot of fungi, most bacteria, and virus and nematodes. Um, not very often, you know, there are some examples for signs that you can see with the naked eye, but some of them are just microscopic or will be hidden in tissues. You may miss them. Uh, symptoms are more what you start seeing, the yellowing, the changes on the plant per se, um, but it's not necessarily uh, in the structure or the pathogen itself. It's just the look of the particular plant. How would you describe what is happening to the plant. Cool. One um, one question that goes back to what we were talking about with oaks is, um, so someone lost a lot of oak limbs during the derecho. What, what to do, um, what to do about that? Because they fell off in a time that we're not supposed to prune yeah, that, that is a very difficult situation uh, with the derecho because um, there is only so much, even you will see in the literature sometimes that um, if you absolutely have to prune an oak because this branch is hanging over a car or something has happened, you may use latex paint um, as a deterrent but it's not as effective as avoiding pruning um, at all. So, and at this point with the derecho, I think it's important to monitor those trees um, for symptoms, deciding, uh, you know, there's so many good resources that uh, both uh, horticulturalists and foresters has put out there so that you make an assessment about the tree. Is it gonna be safe and sound? Because I think that that's, that's the highest concern at the moment. I think in the spring, if some of those uh, trees that suffer uh, in the derecho were red oaks, definitely look for those mats. Uh, and we do have a, an article that shows how the mat looks when um, the bark is on top of it. And it just peaks a little bit, so you may miss it. But if, if you look with, with uh, detail and maybe catch the scent, then you definitely need to go ahead and remove that tree so that that fungal mat is no longer um, a source of the pathogen. Now, there is a large specific, um, there you go. So I think uh, that one is about oak wilt. And I think the one that we did with the fungal mats uh, was in the spring. And I, and I can share that too. Um, but 
but you want to make sure that um, that tree is deep bark so that the fungal mat is not retaining moisture. It will desiccate. And if, if possible, deep bark cover with a tarp so that the fungal mat is contained. Uh, but ideally, if the tree could be chipped completely and disposed or buried would be the best way. Um, if the tree stands with the bark on, the fungal mat is just going to thrive and the beetles are going to come for, for it very easily. Yeah, and your, your job is really tough because you have to look at all different sorts of plants. Um, so I know we, we've asked you about trees and um, one question is about sweet peppers. So around blooming time, the growth is stunted, leaves curl up, and any fruit is small, knotty, and has a hard brown texture. Well, it's not ringing a bell. Um, I guess, you know, when I, when I get a question like this, I would ask, are they all the varieties affected? Like all the varieties of peppers that you have in there? Um, are the solanaceous, for example, if you have peppers, eggplants, and tomato, are they all affected? Again, diseases run in families, um, so you may have a very good clue right there. Um, if it's only that particular variety, it may be that it came with a genetic problem or it came with a virus. So, so many questions. I, I would ask, um, you know, to document how much water, um, you know, that the plants have gotten. And sometimes some pepper varieties are more finicky than others. Um, and so I would definitely ask so much more um, information. And I know you wanted to do some closing remarks before we officially end. Yes. So remember, your best work as a master gardener will be gathering clues and information, looking at symptoms, signs, patterns, describing what you see with the best of your ability. I encourage you to be curious, but also skeptical. Make sure that you do your good investigative work and recognize the implications. Some problems are minor and you can easily take a couple steps to fix them. Some others would have very important implications uh, on high value trees and plants in general. I tell you every day, I need help. From my, from my colleagues, I reach out to horticulturalists, I reach out to plant pathologists. It's okay to need help. Your fellow master gardeners with more experience here uh, on campus, please do remember, we do have a clinic here on campus. And if you happen to move away from Iowa, every land grant university in the United States has a clinic that can help you. And there is so much to learn. So definitely check out the hornews.extension.istate.edu. We have lots and lots of encyclopedia articles on plant diseases, insects. Um, that is really good information right there with photos, what to look for. There is also a newsletter issue that goes out to your email. Um, and in fact, um, I'm going to add an article um, that include all the resources that I shared today. We do have a glossary of terms in there if you want to learn more about what words we use to describe symptoms versus what words we use to discuss um, and describe signs. Um, so make sure you check out the Horde uh, and Home Pest News. It's very easy to su subscribe. You just go in there on this little cubby and type. Um, once you get into that site, you type your email and then it will get into your email once the issue is out. And if you're concerned and if you know if you like nature areas and you visit parks uh, and you want to help track and find invasives so much to learn if you go to firstdetector.org they have a lot of free webinars that you can attend live but also you can watch the recording i recommend this year they had a wonderful one for oakville and i recommend uh, you take the time to listen to it you'll learn quite a bit um, and more than anything, remember, we're here to help. Uh, thank you for participating, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other uh, sometime soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lena. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.